I'll go ahead and end that poll. And so we can see a lot of people grow corn, small grains, and soybeans, alfalfa and grass, not surprising for New York State. About half of the respondents figure they have uh, soil compaction definitely. Other people um, kind of assume it or it's variable on their farms. They're pretty sure it affects crop yields. That was the predominant answer. Yes, it affects crop yields. Do you see it affecting other things like surface water runoff and so forth? So yes is the predominant answer there, or at least sometimes. Okay, I'm going to close up that poll and Warren, I wanna turn it over to you and uh, take it away. All right, um, let's see if I figure the screen sharing thing out. I got it earlier. <laughs> All right, what do you see? <laughs> I see tracks in your title slide. But not presenter view. No, it looks great. Yes, I did it right. <laughs> okay, um, so thank you, Kitty. Um, I'm Warren Schneckenberger. I farm, uh, yeah, in, so I'm in Eastern Ontario. Uh oh there we go. I'm in Eastern Ontario. Uh, we farm right along the uh, U.S. New York border. Um, I'm right, yeah, right along the river. We're about, uh, I, can't, I can't get to New York very quickly because I got to get to a bridge, but uh, I can see New York with about a two minute drive from my house. Um, so we are a border community. We're uh, in I don't know. Ontario is a very large sprawling province. Um, people down here in what we consider Southern Ontario, consider where I am, Northern Ontario, but you can drive for about two days North and still be in Ontario. So it's <laughs> what I consider Northern Ontario and what uh, the people from London do are two different things. Um, so yeah, I farm uh, with my wife and my parents, uh, wife Christine, parents Arden and Rhonda, and uh, we, we farm uh, roughly 3,000 acres of predominantly corn and soybeans, but every year we've been trying to get more uh, wheat, particularly winter wheat. And uh, we played with uh, cereal rye for uh, cover crops. Uh, we played with edible beans. Um, I think uh, with the canola prices where they're at, when the assuming the winter wheat survives winter, I think I'm likely gonna try uh, winter canola on our farm. We, we played with uh, spring canola back in the early 90s as part of an OMAFRA soil and crop project. It, it struggled then. Um, it struggled all across the province. Uh, looking back, it was likely because of club root, um, which is a disease uh, predominantly for canola. It's a real bugger, but back then uh, there was no breeding for it. There is now, so there's a lot of resistance. So I, I think, uh, I honestly think in the fields we can get wheat to grow, I think we'll have a success with winter canola. Um, so that's that's our what we're gonna try. Uh, our topography here is quite level. We have glacial soils, the glaciers ended. Uh, uh, I'm sure those of you across the border in Northern New York uh, know all too well that you guys got stuck with what the glacier was pushing. Um, which is a lot of rocks. We have a lot of rocks also, but at least our soil is level. Um, fairly high calcium soil and like I mentioned, stony. So that's kind of led it it's to our, our own operation, working with strip till, no till, trying to keep the stones under the soil where they are. Um, one of the interesting things about our operation is we are a border. Uh, farm. So we only at best have a half a circle to uh, go for land. So we've had to sprawl quite quite a distance out. Um, and even more so, those of you know the history in the 50s, the seaway was dredged and flooded to make way for the Lakers to get out of the lakes and make it to Montreal. And in doing so, a big chunk of eastern Ontario was lost. Iroquois, Morrisburg, Riverside, are actually communities that were moved. Um, their original downtowns are somewhere near the middle of the St. Lawrence River. Um, and as a result of that water table coming up about 10 feet, a lot of the water courses natural on our side of the river were disrupted. And actually, not only do we have a half a, a ring to deal with, to the east of us is a lot of 
swampy, mucky soils and not a lot of production agriculture. So we really only have a semicircle to draw from. A uh, bit of history. Um, up until about the early 2000s, we were predominantly a corn farm. Um, a lot of corn on corn. We had a beef feedlot, um, so we had some manure to deal with. We're making silage, had some haylage, but at least 70% of our acres were in corn. A lot of plowing um, to deal with that residue going back to corn. Um, and as a result, um, our, we have fairly heavy clay soils. Tillage is going to, you know, compaction is something we fight. Uh, these plows installed a lot of it over the years. Um, being a, you know, tile drainage pretty well every acre we farm is tiled, at least what can be tiled for a reasonable cost. Um, but still, you know, over the years, a lot of deep soil compaction was installed through uh, tillage. Fast forward to today, we tried to flush out our rotation, get more crops in. Um, we've parked the plows. The plows were replaced by the disc ripper. The disc ripper's since been parked, and we strip till every acre of corn we grow. Uh, we're strip tilling our edibles, and I think I'm going to try strip tilling canola. Um, and all our other crops we no till. Um, we're banding most all of our fertilizer now, uh, except for in the soybeans. We do still broadcast some potash there to help build our soils up. Um, but so we, we are really focusing on soil health um, and, and you know, trying to do our best uh, uh, and, try and try and stop the degradation of our soils. Um, we've uh, added a lot of cover crops to our operation, tried to get rotation, keep residue on the surface um, and to keep the soil in the field and out of the waterways. So, like I mentioned, we have clay soils. Um, there are some bands of sand and a few bands of muck, but primarily clay. So our soil and crop organization, you know, compaction is, it's critical for us. It, you know, if we compact our soils, water infiltration goes down. Our crop yields go down. So it's high in our mind. So when we had the opportunity to uh, put on an event, um, uh, we had, we had a really good team of about 30 people, uh, volunteers that made everything happen. And we all sort of had the same focus of, you know, <laughs> this compaction thing, especially as equipment, you know, it, it, it just keeps getting bigger. Um, some of the pieces of equipment you see in that lineup, like that uh, double tanker, 17,000 US gallon tanker, you know, with that tractor, you're 200,000 pounds going across the field and we, you know we, we complain about a little grain cart but these, these massive machines are, are they're only getting bigger and with good reason you know I, I don't know what labor is like in New York but it's it's probably my most limiting uh, resource on our farm right now so a bit about the compaction day uh, so it's hosted by the Dundas Soil and Crop Improvement Association uh, with massive amount of support from uh, local businesses. We had tremendous uh, fundraising, a lot of support from all our dealers uh, and, and other organizations that really wanted to see this this day come come to, to pass. Um, the day we, we hosted uh, on this farm, Savita uh, International, uh, they, they breed and uh, process IP soybeans, perhaps some of the varieties that made it to the New York side, I don't know. Um, but they hosted us on their home farm um, and we had a, a tremendous turnout. We had a little over 300 producers. Buses came in from uh, Quebec, uh, southern Ontario, and it was great to have the delegation from New York come up. I hope they enjoyed themselves. Um, the facility was well suited for us because we had this warehouse. The, the Civita was gracious enough to clear it out. So we had some uh, PowerPoint presentations inside. We had a tremendous lunch. Lunch is key if you're going to host a good event. It's got to have a good lunch, um, which which our caterer did not disappoint. You can see some of the uh, uh, platinum level sponsors on the wall uh, behind the stage. And we had a little trade show. Um, so the, the big day was, it was a lot of fun, but it was only really half culmination of the process. It was, a, it was an entire week we spent, all of us, away from our farms, um, doing 
a lot of research. Um, we had this great opportunity, and so we split off into committees, one of them which was the equipment committee, and they were tasked in coming up with different combinations of equipment that would capture um, what we deem to be what we thought would be the most predominant ways that farmers might compact their soil. Uh, we have quite a bit of dairy in our in, in our area, so forages, uh, silage equipment was there. Of course, cash cropping with big articulated tractors, combines, grain carts, gravity boxes, and uh, we tried. To, um, we weren't really focusing on picking on any equipment manufacturer. We were trying to pick equipment that would be similar weights but would have as many different combinations of tires or tracks or wheels, tire technologies, bias, old school bias ply versus the latest and greatest extraordinarily expensive VF uh, cyclic loading tires. We tried to get as much uh, diversity as we could to make the research, excuse me, uh, worthwhile. So we were the third compaction event to be hosted in Ontario. Um, Pre-pandemic, there was plans for two more. Um, I presume there still will be hosted at some point, presuming the pandemic ever decides to end. Um, but so we were uh, using the, uh, the original one was hosted by the Innovative Farmers Association of Ontario. And they brought over a researcher from Switzerland from Bern University, I believe. Uh, it's a university well known for soil science and uh, the Matthias Stettler, uh, Dr. Matthias Stettler, is I guess the world's guru on soil compaction and he's developed a lot of interesting ways that we could measure soil compaction. You see on your screen there's uh, three black tubes with some sensors on them. And these were installed at three different depths in undisturbed soil, that, that part's critical. Um, so they're driven, there was a big frame with a, a drill, uh, the, the, the soil core was drilled out and these sensors were slid in at six inches, 12 inches and 20 inches, I believe. And they are, um, there's both a physical pressure gauge but also a computerized one so we could map as equipment passed over. And so, you know, six inches, we can do something about six inch soil compaction with tillage, cover crops, rotation, even, even I mean, let's face it, we're in a northern uh, North America, frost is likely going to address a six inch soil compaction. 12 inch, it's getting a little harder. Uh, you know, you're going to need uh, some more specialized deep tillage equipment. And at 20 inches, there's not a whole lot you're likely going to economically do about that. Um, so it, it was interesting to see. So that's the, the sensor side and another photo of them. I believe that was when we were removing them. Um, so the equipment, um, we have, it, was, uh, it wasn't as easy as we thought. There's a lot of thought that went into the process. So we had the sensors, but we also now had all this equipment and we needed to determine, you know, what, what, what have we got? So we had two sites. This was the uh, the weigh-in site, as it was. Um, all of the equipment we loaded to what would be its maximum field capacity. You can see in the combine, it's filled with shelled corn. The sprayer ahead was filled with water. Um, so we were trying to get the maximum compaction that each piece of equipment would uh, would would um, produce. Um, all four corners, we, we documented what the tire was, what technology it has, and then also drove each tire over its own way pad. So something simple like a sprayer or a tractor that may only have four points is one thing, but a tractor dueled up, that's now eight weights. Each tire individually and also what the inflation pressure was set at when the machine came versus then we took the weight and once we knew the weight we went the uh, tire guys who were really keen and a big help to our uh, were the tire retailers the the techs the guys who actually change your tires um, they found this just fascinating um, mainly because uh, they they learned a big lesson is anytime uh, you have a blowout and you have to re 
put a new tire on or reseed a, after you patch a tire, typically they'll fill a tire to 30 PSI no matter what it is uh, because they need that pressure to seat the bead on uh, the bead of the tire on the rim. Um, the produce and it's supposed to stay there for about 24 hours to do that once that's done go back most farmers tend to not go back from 30. Um, that was one of the big eye openers for us at this phase was we when a lot of the tractors were donated by farmers they came right out of their fields and the worst was a, a steiger eight big seven ten seven ten tires um eight tires there was eight different pressures and the range was like 24 psi they were like one was almost flat to over 30 psi um, where those tires should have all been around 10. Um, you know talk about low-hanging fruit just buying a tire gauge and actually checking your tires <laughs> will do probably as much as a lot of things so we we filled the machines we weighed each tires and uh, yeah that was a major undertaking especially when you had track equipment to weigh tracks is not as straightforward as you might think um, yeah a little overview of that facility um, we were blessed to have uh, a, a retailer who sells central inflation systems and he had invested in these uh, really nice very user-friendly way pads um, because you know with tracks it's not just a homogenous thing a track like this quad track has is effectively five axles in one it's not a uniform load across it there's five different weights and we tried to capture as much of that variability as we could and so it, it really made for some for, for some challenges uh getting the weights done but this is this is pretty critical and this is some an, another low-hanging fruit that producers uh, could really get some eye opening um it's not it's one thing to drive your equipment over a, a, a truck scale and get a total weight but when you start seeing the way your weight is distributed on a piece of equipment um, it was it was fascinating just the different even just red versus green four-wheel drive tractors the positioning of the fuel tank which side the hydraulic reservoir was on where the batteries were it could shift half a ton from side to side or corner to corner and so what you you think you know oh well i weighed my tractor front and back and i that's that's my axle weights well in reality it might be your one corner is carrying two tons more um and we saw that with gravity boxes so we uh the equipment, which was all on display the day of, we wrote each individual tire, what it weighed, what the PSI of the tire was set at, and um, a few pieces of equipment like this grain cart that had horrifically undersized tires, uh, the tire guys wrote some encouraging uh, words. Um, they were pretty terrified about these 30.5, 32 bias fly tires on this cart because uh, they were grotesquely overloaded. Um, that tire should not be able to carry more than 12,000 pounds, but this grain cart is asserting this was actually the light side of the grain cart at 25 and a half thousand pounds. The other side was closer to 30, you know, two, two and a quarter times the max safe load for that tire. And, you know, I think I'll, maybe a few of you are looking at this wall. That's a normal grain cart tire. That's a normal combine tire. And, and, and I agree, we, we don't bat an eye at it, but we need to start thinking about this from a safety perspective. You know, like what is the liability of this tire failing or, you know, there's uh, there was definitely some eye-opening experience. Um, I mentioned tracks and them not being homogenous across. This is a two track challenger and uh, you can see, so the three loads, we couldn't separate out the three bogey wheels, but we were able to weigh the front idler, the triple, and the back axle. And you look at the distribution of weight, it's not at all. Most of the weight is being carried on these three tires, and they're the smallest, um, and very little weight on this back driver. Now, this was an unloaded, static, weight you know you add dynamics there's going to be body roll i'm sure it will 
load the drive wheel but sitting still you know there's that this is not a uh, homogenous thing and that really is uh, something about tracks that i think is overlooked uh, by a lot of producers so now more into the fun part uh, the research phase we now had done all our homework we knew what we had for equipment we got our different tires all cataloged now let's make some uh, pretty lines on some graphs uh, so this is some movies, so let's see if we can get this going. So this is my uh, farm sprayer. Um, we had it set up with uh, our floater tires on the right-hand side and our skinny row crop tires on the left. Probably get rid of that noise, it's not really helping. Um, and then as we passed over, you can see the three graphs, 6 inch, 12 inch, 20 inch and you can see they're exerting different pressures as the we travel deeper in the soil it as it would be expected the load is getting spread out more and the pressure is lower so the green the blue and the red are your three different depths and you know many of the sprayers are advertising uh 50 50 or 48 52 uh axle load balance right but you know this is where we started to see some of these differences um, in like I mentioned where the fuel tank is where those things you know and you're starting to pick it up with the uh, with the sensors that yes the axles are balanced front to back um, they're not balanced side to side um, very common failure on this New Holland or Miller Guardian is the back right corner the rim will fail it's failed on me it's failed on there's three or four of these in the area now every one of us has had the rim fail and every one of us got a new rim which was heavily reinforced where ours failed but we're only we're the only people to have ever had the problem um, but you know farmers and we've never had a reason to weigh our equipment by the tire um, but it's something to uh, you know a lot of the things that we consider unexplainable can be explained by uh, weighing your equipment. So carry on with the movie. So as we pass over, so that was the skinny tires. Um, I'm sorry, it's been a couple of years now. I can't remember what the pressures were. But uh, so we saw in the previous with the skinny tires, I believe they would have been up around 50 PSI where, and this is the floater tires where a non-optimized floater tire would run probably around 20 PSI. And so we saw in that first pass in the green, that skinny tire was exerting somewhere around 25 PSI. Now with just by adding a larger tire, we've dropped that now down to about 15. And again, you can see uh, when I mentioned that back right corner being a failure point, well, <laughs> there you saw it, the, uh, the load was much higher on that corner. Uh, looking at the squat, I think we're now down to 15 PSI, which is now that we have a central inflation system on the sprayer. Um, that's where we're running when the machine is full. And just that 5 PSI reduction in pressure, um, we're now able to optimize the tire. And as it passes over, you know, we've now reduced the impact from an average of roughly 15 to an average of roughly 10 it's uh it's pretty impressive and i think we spun around we came back and now we could see the tires squatting on the 380s and now instead of up around 25 the skinnies are now around 15. it's uh this was another one of the i don't know if i'd consider it low hanging fruit for many producers because these inflation systems are not cheap but this is something that can be retrofitted to any machine and can improve your soil, at least from the soil's perspective, the performance of your machine. Um, so these skinny tires on our sprayer, um, we were able to, anyone who's hired a custom sprayer who's come in with a high clearance sprayer like this knows they're heavy. They know you, you don't have to think about where the sprayer is driven. You can see um, they'll, these skinny tires, if it's wet, they will make a rut. And we also, you know, a lot of custom guys or farmers specifically will swap to a wide floater tire, a 650 or a 710, and even some are now up to eight, eight, nine hundreds or even a thousand fifties on their sprayers. 
because we know we can drastically improve the soil. Well, what, what blew my mind was we, with this inflation system, taking that pressure down from above 50, which it needed to be to road safely and dropping it to 25, from the soil's perspective, we've, we've now matched the floater type. So even in crop, my sprayer now is effectively using floater tires from the soil's perspective. And we've been able to improve our floater tires a little bit more. So this, this uh, machine it has been the hit of every one of the compaction days. There's been a variation of it. Um, the latest and greatest from noon. These, you know, the quad trains replace the quad axle uh, machines around here. Um, and now these six axles, and they just keep getting bigger. I thought they were crazy when they were 10,000 gallons, and now we're, we're flirting with 20,000. Um, this machine is even spec to have a 30-foot injector hanging off the back. It was not, uh, the, uh, the custom guy is not opted to buy it yet, but he, he's hoping he can get some uh, producers that are willing to go that route so he can use a grassland injector. So this is low-hanging fruit, and I think it would probably affect a lot of you in northern New York seeing the vast amount of dairy production, a lot of silage. Um, these inflation systems work in these large axle load applications. So here we have, uh, you know, and this tractor doesn't exactly have small tires, nor are these tanker tires small, but because you're roading full, the tires on the tanker need to be at 45 PSI or else they'll heat and just fail. The sidewalls will blow out on them. Those tractor tires need to be at least 20 PSI to grip the pavement so you can have a you can stop but also for traction and and heat's the biggest one with these tankers and so this producer to give himself a competitive advantage fitted both of his tankers with uh, the central it's an agribrink central inflation system so with the flick of a switch in his cab he can go from i believe the lead tank yeah it looks like they're at 16 psi no, that's wrong. Sorry, 45 PSI on this one. And we spins around, he's going to flip a switch and drop them to the lead tanker having 16 PSI and this back tanker having 10 PSI versus the 45 PSI that his competition is running because he doesn't have that ability. And so we can see that, you know, we're getting some pretty high spikes. And what's to be noted is we're getting some pretty high spikes in the subsoil also. Here we can do something with roots, rotation, frost, tillage, whatever. Here we're, we're not going to be able to, at least not as easily. So now the tanker is spun around. He's passing over the sensors again now at a lower. Now I want you to, as the tractor passes by, take note of these tires and watch them flex. It's something that uh, <laughs> when we got our first inflation system, it, you know, it made you uncomfortable seeing that big bulge on these tires. Um, and you know, that tractor when it passed over was somewhere up closer to 10, we're now below five. And then what was even more mind blowing was this. These, these tankers had an insane amount of weight on them. Like, uh, what do we have, 17,000 pounds on each tire. And so we were up somewhere up around here on the first pass, we've cut it in half, somewhere around 10, which according to the uh, uh, professor from Bern, anything below about 15 is you're going to be good. Um, so you wouldn't dare go down the road and see the flex, that huge footprint now of these massive tires. Um, you wouldn't dare go down the road uh, with tires this low. They, would, they wouldn't last the day. Um, but this producer with the retrofit he's made is able to now optimize the tire. And that was one of the I want to say low hanging fruits of what we learned was tires are horribly unoptimized because we always have as producers that compromise between we need the tires hard enough so they don't burn the bars off. We've invested, tires are not cheap and they're not getting cheaper, they're expensive. And we don't want to burn them off on the road, but we also don't want to pack our fields. So we have that balancing act of road optimization, field optimization, and we pick an arbitrary number between based on kind of an hourly tire life. We aim for say 2000 hours 
and we'll try and adjust hires to get us there. And it, it's, uh, it's a problem where something where we can add an inflation system to the tractor implements and these tankers are uh, low hanging fruit. Um, many in Ontario, specifically Southern Ontario, where there's more larger dairies, um, those very large Penta wagons, three axle silage wagons that hold about 50 tons of silage. Um, these inflation systems have been very good uptake on those also because uh, again, we're roading full and the tire optimization wall also you know, try not to hurt our alfalfa crowns or blow tires on uh, on corn stalks. You know, we've made these investments. Um, this one is also interesting. Oops, we got some more noise. Get rid of that. Um, so the tracks and the, this operator was driving a bit quicker, um, and we saw that with the with earlier with the uh, I said tracks are not homogenous. This was an interesting one. It's something a lot of I had never considered um, until we started weighing quadrax. Um, they have five axles. There's three hills here. Um, and we started uh, looking at them, particularly when they were on cement. And that's by design. The lead, the front idler and the back idler on any of that style of track, be it case or deer now, um, with a kind of a rigid while slightly flexing undercarriage, the front and the back are lifted one inch higher um, and it, so that they can turn. It's to reduce the, so the road contact and allow the tracks to turn without tearing up the lug bars. But from a soil perspective, was that a 10 foot long track or seven feet or however long they are? Or is it like a three foot track? Are we getting the full benefit of the tracks if we're on frozen ground or hard ground in wheat harvest? Um, it, yeah, it, it was something that was very, very fascinating. But we are spreading the load out nicely. And if the ground was a bit softer, the one uh, uh, compaction day held in Southern Ontario, it had rained a lot the day before. So they had no problem making ruts uh, on the site. Uh, we were fortunate it didn't rain. Um, but uh, there they were able to see on the quad tracks and the Case New Holland style track combines, they were able to see five uh, peaks. The mess of grain cart, this was a big 11 or maybe a 1300 bushel grain cart. And this one blew our minds. Um, what's going on here? Um, you know, we have a track and it is spreading a load out, we can see that. But what's going on with this lead uh, bogey wheel? Why is it not um, sharing the load evenly? And we had we had speculated a few things. Well, maybe the maybe it needs grease. Uh, pin is sticking. It was a brand new grain cart, and we actually jacked it up and we tested a lot of this stuff. It wasn't it wasn't until actually one of my colleagues from university. Uh, classmates who now works for SUSE as a track engineer, um, he I sent this photo to him and he, he immediately knew. He said, well, the belts aren't tensioned properly. And I went, oh? And I said, yeah, that's that's very common with a reaction arm style track. Um, the belt isn't tensioned properly. And so I said, well, what's the right tension? And his answer was, oh. <laughs> And that's a major issue. We as farmers just blindly assume the tracks are better. And they are better than a single tire because we are spreading out the load. But is this track optimized? Are we getting the full benefit of what we paid? We're effectively paying two, two X or even three X for tracks to carry the same load that a single tire would. And maybe are only getting 50% better performance. Um, I'm sure the manufacturers have the ability to run this sort of analysis and they could probably tell you that the optimal pressure in that uh, tensioning cylinder is 2775 PSI and not 3000 or whatever the tractor puts out to automatically tension. Um, we as producers need to start demanding this and we, this was one of the things we learned that no one saw coming. Um, yeah, grain carts uh, are 
a bugger. <laughs> this uh, single axle design that we have in North America, most of the world has gone to a two or even three axle design similar to the Balzer uh, cart that aren't super popular. Um, North America's opted for tracks, but tracks are expensive. South America has two axle wagon style grain carts. Uh, Europe is real because of their width, they're making very long grain carts and they have three and four axle steerable axles on their grain carts. But in North America, we're stuck with this single axle design. And so our only real option, if you know, if tracks are out of the budget and they certainly are for me, um, they're, they're bonkers crazy. Um, our only option is to use wider tires and better tire tech. And uh, what was very fascinating here was we had that uh, which is effectively an 800 bias ply 30.5 32 super common super popular combine tire still to this day um, this is the standard tire versus a lower tech it was an I think an alliance 1050 radial tire and what was interesting is both of these tires performed badly the radial performed better, particularly in the subsoil, but because the load is so astronomically high for a single axle, we're causing irreparable damage even with the 1050. Now we could go to a 1250 or a 1400 if you have an auger that goes out far enough to allow for it. Um, I wish we, and we're, that's one of the things for the next compaction day is to get a high tech tire on a grain cart, a VF with cyclic loading, or an, even an IF. Um, because of what we've learned actually um, through these compaction days, I've, I own, own this, these are not my grain cart, but I own the same size of grain cart. We're actually upgrading from our 900s that we knew were too small. Um, we're, we're upgrading the IF 1250s with the cyclic loading. Um, because it's actually for the first time ever you, you look in a tire chart and now because of these days I know exactly what my wheel load is that that 1250 tire actually goes high enough on the load rating um, to carry the load so I was pretty excited about that um, so we're, we're upgrading that but because of this lower tier cheaper radial tire it didn't actually perform as well as it should have, particularly in the subsoil. And, you know, yeah, rail tire is always going to be better, and it definitely is. Um, bias or bad, get rid of everyone you own. Um, radial is where you need to be at the bare minimum. Spending that extra, you know, there is, you can go crazy range in radial tire tech. Um, you are getting something for those higher levels. And we did see that in the data. And hopefully uh, OMAFRA will have our data published. It's still not published from our day yet. And then it will be available free on the internet. Um, so that was what we did. Um, certainly uh, I, I have access to data. If we have any specific questions on, you know, what about this? I can dig some stuff up after the presentation. I'm going to now talk, switch gears a little bit and talk a little bit about some of the changes we've made on our farm because of what we've learned. Um, I've mentioned central inflation systems. Um, I, I'm completely sold on this tech. Um, we have two, soon to be four systems on the farm. Um, the first thing we opted for was the sprayer. It's extremely heavy and uh, you know it's making multiple passes a year. The sprayers become our dominant tractor. And then actually because of some scenarios we re we did between three the three sites um, we opted for putting an inflation system on the back axle of our combine because that was one of the things that really blew us away on combines was we spent all this time spending money on the front axle and then just ignore the back axle but in a lot of the brands uh, deer and gleaner for instance um, they have almost as much weight on the rear axle as there is on the front. Even with that massive grain tank and the uh, grain head or corn head on the front, there's an extreme amount on the rear axle. And the rear axle load changes dramatically based on the bin 
fullness and also if you have that counterweight out front or not. Uh, it's definitely something that ag manufacturers need to look at. Um, so yeah, the sprayer, uh, we added the system. We got some cost share funding from the provincial government here. Um, actually, no, we did not on that. We went, we did not get it because I didn't farm in the right part of the province. Uh, <laughs> but I digress. So we added some, so a large storage tank. Um, the compressor was already there, so it was actually a reasonably easy install. So an inflation system is nothing more than a compressor, a st something to store the compressed air, or you get a really big compressor and do on-demand air, but it's cheaper to go with a uh, um, what price range. So an inflation system, um, I don't read on that. I think somewhere between, I guess you'll want it in US dollars too, probably between six and 12,000 roughly, um, which seems like a lot, but you know, replace four tires on a tractor and you're about there. Um, so, you know, if you can get away with extending the life of the tires you have already on something like this, um, especially sprayer tires um, or manure tanker tires that do a lot of road work, um, the, I think you can uh, um, justify the the uh, the expense pretty easily. At least I can. Oh, I gotta click on this again. Um, so yeah, tank, and then we have swivels on the wheels because uh, the wheel turns, and the, we don't want the airline to go with it. That's all bad. And uh, so we had to. I opted to install it myself. Most of the systems are come installed, so that, that's at a fee. Um, but uh, so I, I like fabricating, so we fabbed everything up ourselves so that both tires would work. And uh, yeah, we were blown away. Uh, year one with it, we had a just terribly wet spring. Um, and uh, being able to run, we were even running half loads with our sprayer with 710 tires at 9 PSI and we were still making ruts. Um, a lot of the uh, skinny tire sprayers just, it was it was not pretty. Um, so being able to, and you could do test plots very easily because with the flip of the switch, I could put my tires to any pressure I wanted. Um, so we were able to definitely see that it was floating way better. Um, anywhere we drive over corn or soybeans now, um, we don't really see a thinning in, a, in our stand where we certainly did before at higher pressures and, and absolutely saw it with the skinny tires. Um, but the floater tires now, so following the rows isn't as critical, um, something that I think custom app guys should really consider. Um, the tougher one was making it work in tall corn because you have now these flailing hoses that are out and about. Um, revision one was just over the side and it worked fine for side dressing and doing herbicide but once we got above about waist high I, I knew right away we we're gonna have to do something so we opted to manufacture these uh, wheel guards so we could go in the tall corn and uh, yeah that's that's where it, a1 for us um, yeah actually if I, I had to take this photo with a very strategic angle I mentioned that rim failure well the tire you can't see is actually being supported by a jack um, because of uh, <clears throat> U.S. tariffs on steel imports. Um, Unreferred's got way behind with rims. We actually had to wait about six weeks for a, a rim. Um, and uh, because I had an inflation system, I was able to run on a flat tire for about 4,000 acres of application. Added bonus to an inflation system. Uh, that's my daughter. Um, yeah, so this is, I know what this uh, <laughs> slide was for. Um, the taller corn, especially in a drought year when you get really brittle, um, it can be a real challenge to, to do uh, VT fungicide or we're uh, interceding covers even after tassel with our sprayer. Um, those wheel shields and you get some brittle corn, um, it, it was a must where other producers who have included these uh, systems, they have to take them off when we get into the tall, later the August applications. Um, which is, uh, it's, it's unfortunate. Um, these are a few other, this was the, from the very first compaction day, one of the first systems in Ontario put on a sprayer and uh, just the data, it's posted on the Innovative Farmers website, it's, it's night and day. 
what uh, and it, it's been our experience also the deer sprayer uh, um, yeah the producer actually put it on hoping to lower his tire pressures and he was able to with the front tires but because of the way the deer is balanced 70 30 70 on the rear axle uh, he actually ended up having to run higher air pressure than he was uh, in the without the system on the back axle but he figures he's going to get three times the tire life now and has actually switched to a different sprayer brand since because of the horrible uh, imbalance um, but you know with these inflation systems and the sprayer specifically um, the road is where it's at it takes the bounce out of your sprayer you don't get the side to side seasickness feeling go anymore um, I, this is low-hanging fruit um, the like I said we have a tracked combine Alexion the tracks perform very well in mud um, but because of the Alexion in particular is very balanced with a head it it's incredible with the head off it transfers like two tons to the back axle and as a result to go down the road without a head on these tires had to be at like 30 psi and they would still squat um, so then once you do put that counterweight on you're you're you know you're, you're getting all this benefit from the tracks and very little from the back axle and that's what we saw you know the tracks were doing this great job of spreading the load but then we had this huge spike on the back axle and every run I've ever made with the combine has not been from the tracks. Tracks will, tracks are amazing. They will float, um, but these tires would just cut in. Particularly if you were to stop and back up, and weight would transfer backwards. And we saw it clear as day on the system. And then you know, so I said, well, we can deal with that. We can optimize those tires. And you know, we went from 15 down to now matching what the track does just by adding that system for uh, us I think it was around sixty five hundred dollars to add it to the combine um, low-hanging fruit that you wouldn't think about um, another one that would touch you guys uh, in New York um, self-propelled forage harvesters um, Klaus, for instance has had a factory central inflation option on their Jaguar for like 20 years 95% of them sold in Europe it's it's not an option it's you have to uncheck it to, to buy a Jaguar it's not available in North America it is since about 2018 but it still has no uptake the harvester is a perfect example of where it should have an inflation system because you you have a static load you're always heavy on that front axle and we run big tires on there but we have to be able to run a big tire carrying that 12 or 14 row uh, silage head at road speed because we got to get to the next field quick um, but having the ability to instead of running a 25 psi in the field we really should be at eight and you know how many passes are you making um, i argue if you're going to follow with a dump truck don't worry about it but <laughs> if you're running a high dump cart or some of these more european style silage trailers with larger road uh, flotation tires that's low-hanging fruit terragators low-hanging fruit the back axle horrible soil compaction off the back axle um, these inflation systems really need to be looked at seriously um, we've on our farm uh, adopted controlled traffic uh, we strip till um, one of the key pillars of strip till is you don't drive where you plant um, you're creating these nice little strips and you don't so controlled traffic is easy to fall into if you are strip tilling because you're not supposed to be driving on your rows um, so we uh, we corn is dominant in our rotation so a lot of my focus is always on corn production um, and the strip till and being able to uh, I like systems so everything working together um, so you know we have these two track tractors they're running on 10 foot spacing the Montag fertilizer carts they're running on 10 foot spacing Centerfill planter 
effectively 10, 60 and 120, um, but 10 foot spacing, the sprayer is 10 foot spacing, the combine is 10 foot spacing. So you can now all of a sudden line a lot of things up and you have to itemize what's gonna be your worst uh, offender. And for us, that's the sprayer. We're looking at uh, probably four, if not five now with cover crop uh, passes with that self-propelled sprayer. So I want them all in the same spot. I want to I want to minimize the impact of my wheel traffic to as few rows as possible. 120-foot sprayer, uh, the Kuhn axis will throw cereal rye 120 feet, and we're top dressing and side dressing with the sprayer now also for wheat or uh, corn. And uh, so we're able to focus all of that. Our sprayer's actually been taking the same tracks now on our farm um, with the, a few exceptions that I'll get to in a second um, where I made a few mistakes early on. Uh, since about 2014, we've been using the same paths. Um, rutting is becoming a thing of the past because we have effectively packed as much as we can those paths but wheel traffic is inevitable we we are going to have wheel traffic in production agriculture and we've opted to try and control it as best we can based around the sprayer um, and that comes all the way follows right through to harvest um, i i will let i'm not too granular like australian guys they won't even let their grain cart turn around midfield um, where I, I'm okay with that. <laughs> High yielding corn, the cart has to come back quick, but we try and knock over as few of stocks as we can. We try and control our traffic, taking paths that have already been taken. And if it's harder, especially if we get in a, a fall uh, or winter harvest, knowing which path the sprayer took is not super feasible, but trying to spread out that, or sorry, not spread out, <laughs> focus the compaction is, is uh, it's, a very key focus for us and we are seeing some pretty impressive changes in uh, kernel in years in our higher traffic areas i mentioned some issues so controlling traffic is awesome growing corn is awesome and growing corn with strip till is awesome and growing corn on corn with strip till is really awesome especially if you can effectively eliminate that yield drag you would get with conventional tillage corn on corn um, but now we have to shift over 15 inches. And so now I'm planting where my sprayer has driven 30 times. <laughs> and we've had some issues, um, a lot of issues actually, in that corn on corn year. When we go back to soybeans again, the following year, we go back to the original AB line. But in drought years, we are seeing this, this uh, um, delayed and a, a thinner stand a uh, poorer ear count and a reduced yield and it's not so much that the row itself is ununiform it's just delayed and on a year where we get an early frost or we plant late um, that, that can be a real challenge we've opted we have uh, soil warrior units on our strip till bar we run the twin wavies primarily um, but we've because we control our traffic i have con predictable soil compaction. I can predict where it's going to be in the past and because we're using RTK um, and the controlled traffic with defined AB lines, I can now choose to do deep tillage on four of 16 rows and I'm going to hit my worst case scenario every third pass with it guaranteed. And so I'm now being able to do effectively what a disc ripper would do but without destroying the soil structure of my entire field. Doing it very focused, and we're able to get some pretty amazing results. Um, you know, same soil type, we're 30 inches apart. The left is the twin wavy where there's been no wheel traffic now for four or five years versus that compacted zone. And you, you can see the chunks, but because now we're running that deep cog, we're able to get deep enough, maybe eight inches deep through it create some fractures, we get some freeze thaw, and actually now we've been able to effectively eliminate that yield drag in the corn on corn, but also the pinch row yield drag are, you know, we, I, I, I'm an agronomy nerd. I walk my fields way too much, <laughs> but so I'm, I'm always doing year counts. And because since 
we can focus that deep tillage, we've actually been able to increase kernel counts on the two rows on either side of the sprayer wheels by about 100 kernels per year just by doing this simple change and controlling our traffic. Um, this is just another example of the perfect storm. This is the center of the headland, uh, on the headland where the sprayer would travel. You know, we're, I talk in four, three to four, if not five, sprayer passes in season. It's worse with wheat. Um, headlands get probably twice that. You know, we're turning, we're doing the outside pass and turning. Um, so they get really beat up. And so <laughs> that's just an extreme example. Um, I, I have patience. Um, Mother Nature likes to test it. Um, we will wait. If we, we get a muddy November, we will stop harvest and wait till the ground freezes. Um, our clay is not unforgiving. Um, and sometimes we end up doing, you know, fall tillage for our strips in snow. I don't like doing it. Um, but, uh, you know, it, I, I would rather do the job right than, uh, than uh, do it wrong. Um, oops, I clicked on something else. Um, probably going to be a little discussion on the tracks versus tires. Um, we have both on the farm. Um, both have their place. Uh, I like the tracks. Um, we have a pair of these challengers and I consider them more tool carriers than draft horses. You know, that Steiger is designed for just brute pulling, doing tillage. And we do a lot less tillage anymore. We're, we still do tillage. We have to level and, and we're only human. I say I have patience, but it's usually a day too late. Usually there's always that day where we're like, mm, we really should have gone home. And so, you know, you have to address them. The tracks do come with some cost. There's a lot of maintenance. They're brutal on the road um, and uh, they're expensive. Um, I, for me, in the future, I think uh, if I were, if I could go back, I'd likely only own one track tractor, and the second would be a uh, high horsepower straight frame tractor that would likely, like this one, be set out on 120 inch, so single tires, on 110 foot spacing, and running an inflation system. I think the, where tire tech is now, coupled with being able to optimize that footprint for the job the tractor is doing. I think uh, this concept outstrips the benefits, the cost benefit analysis of a track. I think we can do it with tires and probably be a little happier on the road. Um, yeah, I we've implemented cover crops. Um, I, I fully understand we're in a northern climate. Um, so, you know, we, we saw a few, several of my harvest photos had snow on the ground. We're not dragging a seed drill after corn harvest. Um, we can barely drag a seed drill. You know, getting winter wheat planted can be a challenge some years for us. Um, so we don't have the post harvest option. So we opted to do in season interseeding um, with a high clearance sprayer with boom comes off, spreader goes on, and uh, we're able to cover a lot of acres quickly with this setup, 120 foot passes. Um, so pretty well every acre of soybeans is now for us planted green in the cereal rye. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, uh, yeah. Um, we, we didn't just jump into cover crops. We started small with, uh, we went super cheap, simple herd seeders mounted across. Um, the one year actually we did 500 acres like this. Uh, I don't recommend doing 500 acres like this. It was a lot of work, um, but uh, it was a good way to get our feet wet before making a big investment. We learned a lot, made a few mistakes before we had a lot of acres affected. Uh, but we, we can have, if we get the right fall and a warm, late March, early April, um, we can have tremendous growth. Um, really, uh, really great for the soil. Worms love cereal rye, and we've been able to uh, at least break even with it ahead of soybeans. Uh, we've learned enough how to not lose money. Um, I don't know if we're, like, it, it definitely cash flows, but the how positive a return on investment there is. I think we're at about a break even, um, but that's not 
including the long-term benefits it covers. Um, I mentioned earlier, for me, it's all a system. Um, we, you know, av avoiding compaction is way easier than fixing it. Um, like the control traffic for us, minimum tillage, you know, uh, tillage destroys soil structure. It's why we do tillage is to make the soil looser. That doesn't lend itself well to traffic ability. Um, we've over the years found ways to minimize our tillage, confining it to the strips or just making no-till work. We've put a lot of effort into uh, making no-till soybeans for us exceed conventional tillage in terms of yield. Um, we've worked hard at that. Wheat, adding cereals to your rotation um, does amazing things for your soil. These are things we, we all know. Um, you know, having those forages in New York, um, you know, there was almost as many percentage uh, and you're on the survey in forages as there was in corn. You know, forages, oh, oh, if I could get alfalfa on a quarter of my acres, I don't know what I would do with it all, but oh, oh, that would be amazing as far as the soil and traffic ability. Um, there's huge advantages that livestock producers have. Um, so assuming the pandemic ever ends, and we hope it will, um, there was plans for at least one more in Ontario soil compaction day. It'll be in the Durham region, <coughs> which would be kind of the other side of Lake Ontario from about Rochester. It's not ideal for you guys because you <laughs> have to go around the lake one of, one of the two ways. Um, but if I think it would be well worth your time if, if and when it happens to uh, make the trip up. Um, yeah, uh, that's all I have. Uh, hopefully, um, I'll see if I can uh, follow me on Twitter. I post lots of photos. Um, I guess I will stop sharing. There we go. And uh, yeah. Awesome. Well, Warren, <clears throat> I hope that was comfortable for you. It appeared that it was, um, even though I know it's weird to just talk to no one at your computer. Um, <laughs> We've had a couple of questions come in while you were speaking, and I think we took care of them. I think um, both were sort of answered in your normal, it, with the next sentence or two, about the cost of those central inflation systems. Um, and we have one here now um, that says, what are different tire designations? What do the different tire designations mean and do? as far as the tech you are referring to. So I would think uh, some general information about tire width, the side, the, le the depth of the sidewalls and different m structures might be helpful. Yep. Um, so you, you got those numbers on the side of your tire and now the more expensive they are, they just add more letters. And uh, I hope there's more in the sidewall than just letters on the side, but um, so you have your basic bias ply tire. It's uh, the most basic tire there is. It's what we had through since tires were invented till about the 80s. Um, they're just braided cords, you know, and uh, they, uh, so a bias ply tire will keep its round shape, which means it's gonna have a much higher load in the center. And if you run it at a lower pressure, it will flatten out but now you're making those cords do this all day. And that's why we always had tire failures either on sidewalls or they would quite often have a uh, lug break off where it'd be cracking in along the lugs where a radial tire is built with now steel belts in them and they're designed to run flat and they can do this all day and, and it doesn't bother them as much. And so radials are better because we have a bigger surface area and the tire won't destroy itself which is good because tires are expensive. And then in about uh, well, 2010-ish um, was the first tire tech uh, addition in a lot of years um, was IF, which was increased flexion or something, some tire term, I don't know. But you'll see an IF in front of the tire number. And so what that allowed was we finally are getting some tech in the sidewalls that they can handle flex also. And they can carry more weight. It's just better transfer. And so that means you can run more weight at the same pressure or the same weight at a lower pressure. And then 
that wasn't good enough. So now we have VF tires, which is very Flexion. <laughs> Not a lot of imagination in there naming and that again so if was like 15 percent better vf is almost 50 percent better there's supposed to be a vf gen 2 coming out um that is again going to be better again um i don't know i haven't seen anything about it but uh, it started with small tires and they slowly have gotten the, uh, better and better and it it really the more letters you have on the tire um yeah, IF is like double the cost of radial and VF is like double the, or triple or quadruple the cost of radial. Um, so that's where something like the inflation system, to me, yeah, we're optimizing the tire, but we're also protecting our investment. Um, you know, you see always <laughs> ads on uh, Craigslist or the classified a brand new floater tire that's got three cuts right through it from the corn stalks on a combine because someone in Minnesota couldn't get their crop off, bought $20,000 worth of rubber and effectively turned it into $7,000 of rubber in 100 hours. Um, you know, it's where it's the system, you gotta think. Um, so then every tire, your car tire, whatever, is gonna have three numbers width which is the first number like a 710 is 710 millimeters most tires have gone to metric now and then you're you know, have a dash or a slash i should say and then you're gonna have your aspect ratio which is just a uh, ratio of width over sidewall height the bigger that number the more sidewall you have which means your tires gonna hold more air which we've learned from the compaction you're gonna want a tire that holds more air it's going to give you more flexibility with uh, tailoring um, air pressure. And then your last one is just your rim size. Uh, R for radial and then rim 46 or whatever. That's just in. And of course, even the metric ones switch from metric to standard. Why they don't do rims in metric, I'm not really sure. Um, yeah. We've got a a question now do you know how gleaners balance front to back and with and without heads they're, they're really heavy on on uh, the rear axle that blew our minds because that's their key selling feature right we're thirty thousand pounds less than the competition and they are absolutely no no you run over scale thirty thousand pounds less but the rear axle was the same as the class 10 uh, Kloss tracked machine with an 18 row corn head um, with 600 bushels of grain in it it weighed just as much on the rear axle and that blew everyone's mind and actually our local agco dealer um, on the three combines they have on the lot sent the tires that came with because they'll always run a smaller back tire because the combines later um, actually, they upgraded the back axle on all three in the lot because of what we saw. Um, and now, I bet you that it's better. If you're going to have that small, I don't even know what they are. They're like a, I don't know, a 580 or something, or 24 tire on the back is a standard tire on them. It's too small. Um, the back axle, the, the S-Series John Deere actually is extremely heavy on the rear axle most popular combine um, big tires whatever the biggest tire you could fit on the rear axle well worth your time so warren we have a lot of dairies over here in new york state and so you saw from the cropping you know um answers to the crops questions there at the beginning that we have it looks like dairy farms right there's a lot of alfalfa grass and a lot of corn with a few other things. We have a lot of forage trucks and harvesters um, going across the field three, four, five times. We have a lot of manure tanker trucks and, um, and tow behind tanks going across the field multiple times a year. Um, one of the things I remember takeaway messages from the field day a couple summers ago was that this idea that if if a machine is designed to do to travel on the road it's probably not good to have in the field and if it's really good in the field it's probably unsafe to take on the road so what 
can you share some thoughts about the forage harvesting system? I know you don't harvest a lot of forages yourself, but you can extrapolate what you've learned. Forage harvesting and manure spreading and what folks in New York could think about regarding those two processes. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, trucks are bad. Trucks are really good. We run trucks for our grain, um, big trucks like B trains. Um, and we do park them on the headlands. Um, we have very narrow roads in our county, so loading on the road really is not an option in a lot of cases. So we, we try and we try and not do it for neighborly reasons. So we will park on the headlands. We won't drive 10 miles across the field. We will just turn around and bring everything with the grain cart. Um, yeah, the I don't know if you can fit those silage trucks with a large flotation tire um, it's going to be better for the soil they're expensive they make the, you know any any tire that goes down the road that's your money going <laughs> burning the treads off but it's probably worth it um, and if you can't do that I know you're gonna get mad at me because I'm gonna suggest dump carts and that's slow um, but something that's optimized for the field um, with large tires um, if you're in highly susceptible soil um, I, d I don't know like the alfalfa is really expensive to establish and i don't know but our side of the river we're lucky to get two years out of a stand anymore um, you know you're driving on alfalfa crowns with a truck tire at 110 psi that yield is it's gone and that might be your first cut of a new seeding it's gone um you know being eh, it's i can sympathize because i know dairy in the states is not dairy in canada um you know real tight margins so you don't want to spend a lot but the silage trucks it, it makes me cringe every time i watch a youtube video from northern new york um but it i also get it we, we had a feedlot i i know silage is crazy high volume we, we ran forage wagons with truck tires my whole life and I also saw the ruts they made um, but uh, yeah it's it's a challenging one um, yeah like forages do such good things for the soil but forages also can you know if you, you get in the backwards weather man oh man there's a lot of wheel traffic um, but also like in one of the larger dairies around here, um, they do control traffic in their forages. You know, you, you have that ability in haylage, especially with that merger. Um, as long as you are using a GPS so that you can do it the same every cut, you can at least minimize where your trucks are traveling, have dedicated truck routes or something through the field. Um, you know, there's a lot that can be done. This. Um, and then, of course, the lowest hanging fruit, and I know it makes a really good YouTube video with the drone, is maybe don't have 23 trucks following you through cutting open the field. I know it looks cool, and I would probably do it too, but, you know, just training dr operators to drive at least follow each other. Don't take a new path every time. Don't just take the shortest route. Cut along the head rows. End rows. Um, you know, there's a lot that can be done. I a, but I also sympathize with the current world price of milk and the margins in the dairy industry. <laughs> we, we have we have done uh, made a lot of progress in recent years to keep manure tankers off the field with drag hose systems yeah. um, and with edge of the road little driveways to a tanker that you can drag hose from a, a container and even if you don't have a pit nearby um, to keep some of those road heavy road implements off the field. Um, it seems harder to do with the forage harvesting um, operations, but it's definitely going in that direction, I would say. Yeah, but uh, drag lining is better if, if you have a tractor that has optimized tires. If you have a tractor that has three of the eight tires at 35 PSI, that 200,000 pound, 17,000 gallon tanker is going to do less damage. Um, so, 
So maybe that's a good thing to, to, to describe. If you had none of this information on your farm, where do you start? Do you get a, a scales and start weighing tires? What do you do? Go to Menards and buy a tire and check her gauge. And just check all your tires. That was uh, one of the best, we had a survey of participants after the fact. It was emailed out and there was a place make comments and we had eight or nine producers write the exact same thing um, that I went home and checked all my tractor tires and I found three tires that were completely flat and like all my planter tractor had like the, all four tires on the back axle were different oh my what am I doing or you know just just make them all the same that's the lowest hanging fruit um, check your tires um, you know and then check them more than once a year uh, it's uh, what is it every degree sorry degree Celsius every degree Celsius and ambient air temperature change your tire inflation pressure will change 1% so a day like today where it's minus 10 Celsius um, or a day where you might have checked in July when you had time when it was you know 24 28 or 30 degrees Celsius your tire has dropped lost a whack of pressure um, in a soybean harvest day where you start in the frost on the morning and it goes up to or I'll talk in Fahrenheit goes up to 80 degrees to up from 40 in the morning your tire pressure has changed five or six psi um, so it's something that we have had to um, start to pay attention to now that we're trying to optimize tires and run really low is you got to keep keep up with it because as it, the year goes on and temperatures drop if you had a tire that was running at 8 psi you know a few percent change it might fail at the bead the bead might just pop off because it runs too low um, if you run them at 30 you don't have that problem <laughs> So what do you consider optimized? That would be the next question is what pressure are you shooting for? Just what it says on the tire or what the manufacturer says or something that you've learned well, outside best, of that? The best tool you have and really one of the only tools we have is those tire charts. You take whatever your tire is and you punch it into Google and it'll come up with this big chart with a whole load of speeds, weights, and you, you figure it out. So you're also going to need to know what your equipment weighs and you know a lot of a lot of farms have truck scales now um or you can get access to tire guys a lot of them have now have these way pads um and uh, so it, it's it's eye-opening um you know and you gotta weigh a couple times a year because if you have a i don't know a hay merger or something on and all summer but then you swap to your I don't know plowing in the fall with a big mounted rollover plow there's a massive diff change in your axle load and your tires are going to have to change and duals changes everything and speed changes everything but those tire charts are they're they're a good starting point and that's what we've used a lot um if you find the right tire regional guy they can get you more in-depth tire charts um a lot of the tire manufacturers now are come around to the fact that central inflation it's it's you know the, watch youtube videos uh from europe um once you now know what to look for 90 percent of tractors in europe have an inflation system on their subs well i don't want to mention subsidy and company of american farmers but <laughs> um european farmers are subsidized 2x what a u.s farmer is and so they have a lot more they have programs that they get subsidized to install this stuff but they've also done the hard work of doing a lot of this research and now have got the tire manufacturers developing tires to be run at two different pressures all day every day and uh, so it is good but if you find the right tire guy um, michelin is now coming out with uh tire charts for different pressures and different speeds uh, trying to couple with uh, central inflation systems um, it, yeah it is getting better uh, for sure but those tire charts it's better than nothing 
be at least uh, you can start to make intelligent estimations um, you, you know we all know roughly I'll have been running at say 15 psi on this grain car tire and I'm okay with the tire wear I've experienced and you look on the chart and you can now kind of extrapolate what's you can kind of estimate where you should be and it's a good starting point um, but you know tires talk to you that if you start seeing really weird tire wear you probably have either too high or too low and tire guys yeah they uh, they so will answer start... your questions if you ask the right ones <laughs> yeah so you start with a tire gauge in every tractor truck in every pocket probably yeah. and and go get some tire uh, some of those charts and then after that you have something to learn with and you know as you know like for us we we didn't do everything at once it's been a you know every time we for us now we're very mindful because of what we learned you know if it comes time to upgrade uh you know oh i drove over a deer antler uh, i guess well you know you start thinking well maybe we shouldn't just buy this is what we had maybe this is an opportunity and that's exactly what happened to my grand guard this fall drove over a big old like nine pointer nine old uh, 90 percent tire yippee um so we i decided to upgrade to what tires should have come with it from the manufacturer but didn't um you know if you buy a new combine or you're a custom you're relying on a custom operator and there's two or three to choose from choose the one with the biggest tires um, it's probably going to pay you back and, and it's hard to evaluate those changes unless you have both custom guys doing replicated trials <laughs> <laughs> what other questions or comments do we have out there in the audience i've been asking all of my questions so one question i have kitty is uh <clears throat> You move to control traffic at least at, at, in certain crops on the farm. Um, we have a bunch of grain growers that went to strip till uh, back a few years. What's the expense of trying to set up for control traffic or a guesstimate? You know, what would they have to start looking at? Uh, I could control traffic with spending zero money um look at a corn soya bean farm um no-till the beans you just follow the corn stalks drive the same path you did before with an offset hitch so you're not planting right on the corn stalks um you know or you could spend a whack of money <laughs> and buy yourself multiple rtk systems um a lot of it's more the cultural change and training um, if you have a larger farm with a lot of or even worse is it might makes it a lot harder as uh, temporary workers that are only you know part-time just for the fall or something um, that uh, have experience but not you know they just have experience they're, they're, they've never been taught to hey don't make a new rut every time you come in the field um, you know um, so if you want to do it right you need rtk at least i don't want to say right but it makes it easier because now you have the line and and some sort of software for your computer because uh, some of the errors we made was where we named a b lines poorly and then you select the wrong a b line and then you're not driving where you're supposed to be um and you know we all we all know farming we get fatigued and so trying to make things as easy as possible is why we went with RTK um, and little fancier field computers in the trackers. Um, but yeah, that line management is key. Wrapping your head around that before you decide to start is uh, it's critical. But like I have a few friends that strip till without even auto steer. So you know it is, it is doable, but they're farming on a much smaller scale and can take the time they're doing it themselves they you know I, I i have everything up here what i want done it's i, I struggle with communicating sometimes <laughs> what i want done um so it, it depends on your operation but yeah you, it, you, you don't have to spend very much just something a simple change like not letting the grain cart or your silage trucks drive diagonally to the gate 
that they drive on a path that's already compacted and across, that could increase haylage yields, I bet you, by 5%, 10%, just that little change. And it's not going to slow you down. Um, you know, something like that. Having dedicated, even if you want to drive diagonal, have a dedicated route with the tankers and silage trucks follow. Even through your corn, have, I don't know, make it reed canary grass, something that can handle trafficking, um, something like that. There's, there's a lot of outside the box thinking. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, so you mentioned <clears throat> converting a bunch of your equipment over to a 10 foot spacing. That wasn't really that big of an expense either. Well, it was. Uh, <clears throat> It wasn't something we actively saw it just happened that way um when we went to strip to well we added we upgraded to a 24 row planter and we wanted still dry fertilizer so we went with a montag um red on new ag talk montags are good yeah. great so we got one it came with 10 foot spacing the sprayer is 10 foot spacing it came that way and then when we went to strip till we we liked the montag so we got another one and uh and then uh, we tried the track tractor liked it and got another one <laughs> so it, it's it's uh and then once it was all there and it just we kind of fell into it by accident almost um that uh it just sort of worked out um it doesn't have to be 10 foot spacing it could be uh, five foot spacing um but yeah it, it's just for us the sprayer and the combine and grain cart are our big compactors um, so that's why our system is based around that. Um, it, every farm is going to be different there. I just, sorry, Jeff. Oh, so, so you mentioned, you know, everybody, when they are looking at an investment, they, they want to see, you know, the return on investment or the payback time. And you mentioned uh, with the air system that part of that payback was return on entire life. Can you explain that a little bit more? Um, VF tires, especially the first gens, um, they had really poor tread life. Um, they, I don't know if they underestimated uh, road speeds or something, but road travel was really burnt. It's a problem. They were burning treads off, specifically on sprayers. Um, the original spray bibs were bad. Um, the firestones that we have were horrible. Um, so we were losing like 30% tread a year um, on our very expensive VF tires um, since we added the system. And so we were running, again, it's that blend of road versus field performance. We are running in the middle at about 25 PSI on those uh, VF tires. Um, we're now at the flip of the switch. I'm running them at uh, 55 PSI on the road. They're rock solid. Um, we've eliminated that tire wear. Um, so, you know, a set of sprayer tires of say Michelin spray bibs or there's a new Trelleborg that's a lot of uh, producers have switched to they're almost like four thousand dollars a tire so you, you don't want to be burning that off every two years <laughs> and a custom app guy who's doing 20 ish thousand acres a year you know he, he's probably driving 20,000 miles a year on the road um, and an ag tire so for, yeah, like that roading is, uh, those are your low hanging fruits, those silage wagons or trucks. Um, it's actually, you run the inflation system on trucks too. If you run a truck, a truck tire will hold the bead fine at 30 PSI. It just don't go more than 10 miles an hour with it or you'll have a bad day. Um, and uh, you know, like the oil sands are uh, out in the Dakotas, the um, fracking guys, every single one of those mining trucks, I guarantee you, has a factory in central inflation system. Uh, my, my set of B-trains has a Hendrickson uh, central inflation system. We don't use it to adjust uh, pressure, but it's set to as long as the trailers are 
uh, supplied with air, all the tires are at 105 psi. Um, a simple controller change on a dump truck, you can go from 110 down to 30, and yeah, it, there is a lot of options there. I think that's low hanging fruit. I know it sounds expensive, but I don't know, everything's expensive. <laughs>